Now, we're turning to the Word of God this morning, and we're turning to Paul's epistle to the Colossians, please. Paul's epistle to the Colossians. And we're turning to Colossians chapter number 1, please. Colossians chapter number 1. Paul's epistle to the Colossians. And we're in chapter number 1. And we'll commence reading at verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints, and for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God and truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, and giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist, as He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Amen. And we know that the Lord will add His blessing to the reading of His own precious truth. On Friday morning just past, a dear friend and a brother in the Lord called at our home. And sitting on our home over a cup of coffee, both he and I began to talk about the things of God. He's a dear friend, and he's a dear brother. And he and I began to talk about the things of God, and he began to share with me all the great blessings that he has been having recently, reading through the, the Word of God. And then he said something very striking, and said something that is very strange. He said his pastor one Sunday morning told his congregation that if this was the Christian life, if this is the Christian life, if this is the Christian life God has, has given to me, he told his congregation that he would be bitterly disappointed. He told his congregation that Lord's Day morning that if this is the Christian life as I know it, well then, I'm bitterly disappointed. 
I wonder this morning, child of God, are you disappointed as a Christian? There are many Christians who are disappointed. There are many Christians today delusioned. And I wonder this morning, child of God, are, are, are you a disappointed Christian in your Christian life? Well, you see, what Brian has agreed where has answered back there, no. Well, he's right because we have no reason to be disappointed. You see, this pastor told the congregation this Lord's Day morning that he's seeking God and he's waiting on God for a new thing. He's seeking and he's waiting on God for a a supernatural experience. He told the congregation that he's waiting and he's seeking God for some real blessing to be poured upon him. And at the moment, he's a disappointed Christian. But you see, child of God, here's what I cannot understand. When Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, this is what Paul says. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And the part I cannot understand this morning is this. If God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus, what blessing then has God held back from this man that has made him so disappointed? God has held back no blessing. You know, child of God, it should thrill our hearts this morning to know that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. But since the day we have been saved, since the day our journey for heaven began, there's a wee question the Lord wants you to ask yourself. And He wants you to be honest with your own heart. Since the day you were saved, brother, since the day you were saved, sister, how often have you sat down and paused and pondered over the blessings of the believer? When was the last time you sat down, perhaps alone with the Lord, with your Bible in your hand, and considered the blessings of the believer. I wonder is it every day for many you should? Or is it a wonder is it just once in a while or once in a blue moon? Maybe perhaps none at all. Have you ever sat down this morning, child of God, and considered the blessings of a believer. You see, so many Christians today, and it's sad, they're all out for the emotional blessings, out and out for the temporal blessings. But you know, temporal blessings and emotional blessings this morning, they fade and they flee. I hear people saying we need a change. Oh, that's what we need. We need a change. Something has to change to bring back the blessing that I once had. Something has to change. You're right, something has to change. But I'll tell you what has to change. Our direction. Because we need today change direction. 
we need today as believers get back to Calvary. We need to get back to the cross. We need to get back to the place where Jesus suffered and where Jesus bled and where Jesus died. Why? Because Calvary and the cross and Christ's atoning death and His precious blood is the foundation and the source of all blessings in the believer's life. You know, child of God, this morning it's so true. Friend, when we lose sight of Calvary, when we lose sight of the cross, when we lose sight of Christ, when we lose sight of the blood, we lose sight today of the real core and heartbeat and soul foundation of Christian living. There was a man, an old man he was, up until December 1973. Every Friday, every Friday without fail, in the evening, was seen walking down by the pier, slightly bent over with a bucket of, of shrimp in his hand. Every Friday he went to the same spot, sat on this seat at the pier. And as he appeared, seagulls from everywhere came, and he fed the seagulls with the shrimp. A young man sat down beside him and asked him, what's the whole idea? I, I've been watching you for years coming here, and, and you're feeding the, the seagulls above, above all birds with shrimp. Why? Can you explain it? I can, son, he says. I can. He says, I was a pilot in a plane during the Second World War. And we were sent to fly to a certain area out in the Pacific to General Douglas MacArthur. And he says, we ran out of fuel, and we knew we weren't going to reach the land. We ditched the plane in the sea, hundreds of miles from any place. We got the life raft out, and we blew the life raft up with it inflated. There we were alone in that life raft, six of us. For many days we sat there with no sight nor sound of hope from anywhere, surrounded by sharks, almost burned by the daytime sun, but our worst enemy wasn't the sharks. Our worst enemy wasn't the sun. He says our worst enemy was, was starvation. We counted the days. It was Monday when we ditched the plane. Now it was Friday. Because it was Friday, we thought, we thought we're never going to see the weekend. One of the men who was with us was a Christian. And he said to the young man, he says, listen, you're a man who's in touch with God. Will you pray for us? And the young man prayed as the sharks circled around their, around their raft. He sang a hymn, and this man, Captain Eddie, that was his name, he pulled his, he pulled his hat down over his head to give him some shield from the sun. In one moment, he felt something landing on his head. He knew it's a seagull. The men were so amazed that here we are, nowhere from land, and yet a seagull 
a seagull out of, out of nowhere has appeared and, and landed on this man's head. The seagull meant one thing, it meant food. And when Captain Eddie reached up to catch the bird, it never flinched. He took it. He wrung its neck. He killed it. Plucked it, ate its flesh, divided its flesh, used its intestines to fish and to catch fish to keep them going until they were rescued. And when he had finished and saw through the war, Every Friday, when he moved to that pier in Florida, every Friday, he took a bucket of shrimp and went down to feed the seagulls in appreciation for that one seagull that gave itself for them. Child of God, do you know why there are so many Christians today disappointed in their faith, disappointed and disillusioned today in their Christian walk? Lost sight of Calvary. And Paul brings these Colossians today, he brings them back to Calvary. Do you know, child of God, Calvary will never, ever have to reoccur. It's a finished work. But you and I will have to revisit Calvary to a fully appreciate what Christ did for us. This is why the table is here, so that we can remember the one that loved us and gave himself for us. And I cannot understand why the redeemed of the Lord turn their back on this table. There's something wrong. Wonder have you lost sight of Calvary? Child of God, have you lost sight of the cross? Have you lost sight of Christ this morning? You see, first of all, Paul talks about the sense of our salvation. Verse 13, he speaks of this, speaking of Christ, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Friend, what a wonderful blessing that is for the believer. What a wonderful blessing this is this morning, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Just think this morning that history's crowning moment occurred. History's crowning moment occurred when Christ died for the ungodly. History's crowning moment occurred when Christ died for us. History's crowning moment was when the Son of God loved me and gave Himself for me. History's crowning moment pinpointed at Calvary. He didn't die just for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Christ's death this morning was a selfless, one-sided act of love. He didn't love us because we loved Him. No. For there was nothing in us to love. There was nothing in us, only the rottenness of sin. There was nothing only, there was nothing in us, only the filth of sin. But in spite of that, He loved us. You know, friend, that's a powerful thing. When you look back to the cross and remember, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, that He sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. You see, the person of salvation. In Colossians chapter 1, 
Verse 21, Paul writes, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Oh, child of God, disappointed Christian, we need to get back to Calvary. We need to get back to the cross. We need to get a fresh glimpse today of the crucified Savior and see the source of real blessing for the believer. If we fail to consider Calvary, if we fail to consider the cross, if we fail to consider Christ this morning, if we fail to consider His precious blood, then our love grows cold. This is what the Lord Jesus commands us. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this wine, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. This do, he says, this do. Why, Lord? Why? In remembrance of me, O believer. Search your heart as you turn your back from the table. Think of the cross this morning. Think of the agony, the pain. Think of the shame. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? You're sitting this morning in this fellowship, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. But when was the last time you sat at the Lord's table and broke the bread in remembrance of Him and says, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord for making me whole. Calvary is the source of the blessings. There are so many disobedient, sorry, disappointed Christians today, and they spend more time blaming this one, and they spend more time blaming that one, and they spend more time blaming the other one, and they spend more time blaming this, and they spend more time blaming that, and they spend more time blaming the other thing. Ah, friend, do you know where the real problem lies? They've took their eyes off the cross. I don't know how many years ago now. It's a good while ago. Mind you, my love grew cold, and I'm not going to stand up here and think and tell you I'm super spiritual. I'm not super spiritual in any one way. But many, many years ago, there was a time my love grew cold. I could almost say I left my first love. I wonder, is that you this morning? You have left your first love. I remember one day lifting a hymn book, a hymn book, and it opened up to that hymn, Oh, for a closer walk with God. And I came down to one verse that it pierced me like a dart. It said this, Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is that soul-refreshing view of Jesus and, I, and His Word? Here I was, cold in heart. And as I searched for the solution and as I searched for the answer and I waited, this is me. Where is the blessedness that I once knew when first I saw the Lord? And suddenly the answer stirred at, them, stirred at me. There it was, the answer. Where is the blessedness I knew? When first I saw the Lord. You see, when I first saw the Lord, I saw him crucified on a cross. Through that wee church of Ireland rector, he brought me to Calvary the night I was saved. He told me about the sufferings of the Savior. He told me about the death of the Savior. And he told me that there's no other way to heaven, only through him. And suddenly, I realized, oh, this is it. 
This is it. This is where I've lost it. I've took my eyes of the cross. I've got away from Calvary. You know, child of God, maybe that's you this morning. You've, you've got away from Calvary. You've got away from the cross. It's nothing to do with anybody else. That's only an excuse. Nothing to do with anything else. That's only an excuse. The thing is, this morning you've got away from Calvary. Oh, yes, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Oh, friend, you think of it this morning, child of God. You and I were once under the authority of Satan. Imagine where you once were, child of God. Ephesians 2, verse 2, Paul said, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Look back this morning and remember the blessings of the believer that we have in salvation. Think that we have been delivered from the powers of darkness. You know, child of God, we lived, and there was a time we moved, and there was a time we had our being under the full control of Satan's authority. But the sense of our salvation is this. He brought us out of bondage into blessing. He brought us out of death into life. He brought us out of darkness into light this morning. I think that's enough to bless your soul with. The blessing of the believer, the sense of salvation, Romans 8, 31, 32. He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Tell me this, child of God, have you lost sight of Calvary? Have we lost sight of the cross? Have we lost our focus on Christ? Have we lost the preciousness of His blood? The sense of our salvation. Then Paul brings before them the, the truth of our translation, because in verse 13 it says, And hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, Let's remember something this morning. Do you see, child of God, as to what has happened to you and what has happened to me and what has happened to us? Religion had nothing to do with it. It was all through what Christ did for us in the cross. From the moment we were saved, we were translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. He took us from under the power of Satan's authority. He took us out of Satan's kingdom and translated us under the power of God's authority and into Christ's kingdom. And child of God, remember today, you're no longer under the authority of Satan. We are under the authority of God. And sometimes, child of God, we forget it's God's authority, not our own authority. And the moment we were saved, our history as sinners was ended. The moment you were saved, child of God, brother, the moment you were saved, your history of being a sinner was over. We are now heirs of God. This morning, child of God, we're joined heirs with Christ. What did John say? Now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He really is. And listen, child of God, we might be living on planet earth, but we are the subjects of heaven this morning. Ah, oh, think this morning, disappointed believer. 
Think of who you are. Think of what you are. Think of where you are really as a Christian, and you won't be disappointed. Oh, yes. Billy Graham said this, so when the temptations and the seductions of the darkness from which you have been removed threaten to reign in your heart, remember your new postal code. You're in the kingdom of his dear Son, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Finally, look at verse 14, the reality of redemption, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I want you to notice two things. First of all, verse number 13 begins with Christ who? Verse 14 begins with Christ in whom? Verse 13 talks about a past tense. Verse 14 talks about a present tense in whom we have redemption. Do you know what that means this morning? That means that Christ's work of redemption in our present is a present and continuing possession. And think of it this morning, purchased by His own blood. In 2012, an American naval seal was captured by Afghan insurgents, tortured, cruelly interrogated, and would have been murdered only for fellow Navy SEALs. Through secret intelligence, they were able to locate him. And many of the team says it's too risky for one man too risky. Commander William Harry McRaven, commander of the Navy SEALs then said, one man is too precious to let go. Four helicopters appeared at the scene where he was being held. The elite team was sent out they successfully took out the insurgents that were holding him. As they were making his way, their way to back to the helicopters, one insurgent who was a sniper shot the man who was captured. One of the Navy SEALs who was there to rescue him left the helicopter again, went over and carried him. And as he placed him on board the, on board the helicopter, Suddenly another bullet hit the man who rescued him in the head, and his head exploded him, exploded. And he was splattered in his, this man, this injured man was splattered in his blood. Right up until this day, he said this, I am forever free through the price of another's blood. That's you and I this morning. You and I are forever free through the price of another's blood. That's how you and I are redeemed this morning, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus, set free from the curse of sin, set free from the guilt of sin, set free from the penalty of sin, set free from the very punishment of sin. As we just bring this message to a close, can you see today the real blessings of the believer? It's not a new thing we need at all. We have everything. This gentleman who visited me on Friday said this to me, and I thought he was right. 
He said in his church, there's men who get up and they pray. We need more Christ. We need more Christ. And my friend thinks they're wrong. He says, in fact, when they say that, he believes they're insulting Christ. Christ? Right enough. How do we need more Christ when Christ has given us everything? And this is what my friend says, and I agree with him. It's not more Christ we need. It's less of the rubbish that we have cluttered in our lives is what we need. It's not more Christ at all we need. It's getting rid of the rubbish that we have allowed to get into our lives. Calvary, the cross, Christ, and His blood, these are the real, eternal blessings that every child of God possesses. And may God bless our hearts through what He has said to us through His Word today. We're going to sing as our